Hi, everyone. It's Jeff Cohen. I'm here, and I'm just looking for people as they roll in and wanted to give everybody a little bit more time. I'm also trying to coordinate here because Autumn is in my office showing me how to talk to a computer, which is a little weird. But I, I'm looking at the buttons. I think I pushed the button that makes you all hear me, which is good. Did I do it? Yeah. I did it? Good. Good. Awesome. Okay. So I'll give it a couple more. Yeah. One more minute. One more minute. My chief advisor is telling me one more minute. Yeah? Cool. Awesome. And I can see. I put my glasses on. Good. All right. Hey, everyone. This is Jeff Cohen from the Florida Healthcare Law Firm. Thank you for taking the time today to have me drag you through a very condensed version of some of the stuff that I normally talk about in the ID industry. Um, uh, special thanks to two people that you're not going to hear from on this call. One is Gina, he Gina uh, Meyer, um, who runs AVA, the American ID Association, and a uh, very dear friend for a long, long time, and she's uh, hosting this. Um, also, big thanks to Autumn Galgano, who not only runs the law firm, but um, she kind of does everything in collaboration with Tina. And she's a dear friend and is the reason why we're not a law firm of two people because uh, you can't work in a business and on a business at the same time. Anyway, um, so I think you've got my background. You all know about me. I'm a healthcare business lawyer for 35 years. And we, the Florida Healthcare Law Firm, we represent a ton of IV hydration providers, not just in Florida, but all around the country. And um, and I think one of the, the great things about being in business for a long time, those of you who have been in a particular industry for a period of time, is you get so much data in your head that you get pattern recognition real quick. And so I want to talk about the industry, the IV hydration industry. I want to talk a little bit about the law. Everybody has access to this presentation. You get to take it. There's some good information in it, some good uh, facts and things like that in the presentation. But what I don't want to do is drag you through reading this. I'd rather give you my view of what I'm seeing, some of the pattern recognition, some of the things that I think you're going to need to uh, take away and know. Uh, one is we're in what, what I call the flourishing stage. The flourishing stage is, is where you just see IV hydration business is popping up everywhere. Mobile, fixed site, they're everywhere. And it's not just Florida. It's all over the country. Um, and on cruise lines and things like that. So you begin to see this, and it, 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 it just looks like the emergence, the emergence of something substantial, the front end, if you will, of a wave. And we've been there before. We saw it with addiction treatment. Obviously not related to IV hydration, but we saw the emergence of that industry. And if you followed it before, we saw the emergence of compound pharmacies, the emergence of uh, DME. Um, all these uh, waves of industry rollout, and that's where we are with IV hydration. It's the most obvious, fastest growing segment of the uh, healthcare sector today. Um, I, I wouldn't be shocked. I was I was in California for an uh, for an AVA event, and I saw an exit sign that said, you know, exit here for like Bob's uh, ketamine clinic, and I thought, what? It, it it blew me away that ketamine clinics had gotten such a level of normalcy and notoriety that you could drive down the internet and you could see a sign on the internet that says, get off here, you can find one of these things. Well. I wouldn't be shocked if we end up doing that in the IV hydration business. And that's fantastic for the industry. And I think there's a couple factor, factors I've written on it. So, uh, and I, you've probably seen the same things that I have. The expense to get into the ed industry, not very high. The level of skill set to get in the industry and do it well, not very high. So you have low barriers to entry and people are just spilling into it and timing is an issue. Um, 
we really saw a huge uptick in in uh, this industry rolling out, kind of at the tail end, if you will, of COVID, when people, clinicians, nurses, PAs, APRNs, were just burnt out in the intensity of that space of uh, of being in a hospital and wanting to find another way to make it maybe the same money, maybe even more on more relaxing, more um, on terms that were more controlled by them. And so for a while, we were just getting all these phone calls from nurses leaving the institutional environment and populating into the IV hydration space. That's when we knew when the frequency went from one a week of those kinds of calls to several a day. We said, wow, we have a serious, serious wave in this industry. So that's that's the state that we're at. You're flourishing. This is great. This is great. But you also notice that there are um, that that it's it's not the end stage of the industry. We know that you're going to be having to face regulation. Regulation, right? If you come from a hospital environment, you know about the Joint Commission. You know about the Department of Health. Um, if you're licensed as a nurse, you know about the Board of Nursing, um, and you understand ACA, things like that. In other words, you know that what you do is incredibly regulated. Um, how you behave, physician supervision, scope of practice, all those things you know about. And in your current clinical uh, past or your near past, when you're working in a hospital or a nursing home or home health, there was a particular pattern that you would follow of diagnosis, uh, prescription treatment, and then you would make sure that everything was documented for medical necessity. You follow that pattern. But those kinds of details and that kind of um, uh, pattern is largely missing from the IV hydration space. Uh, in fact, the dominant model, not the only model, but the dominant model of IV hydration is what I call the juice bar model. And the juice bar model really depends on the patient to walk in, take a look at cool named bags and say, I like that one. I want the ultimate athlete package. Why? Because I, I, I just like the sound of it. I like um, the hangover bag because for obvious reasons, I need that. I, I drank too much last night. But the juice bar model um, really relies on patient education, patient uh, decision making. And in my opinion, it is a recipe for a problem. And I'll talk about that as we go through this presentation. But if you're going to take a layperson who works, let's say, in an accounting office down the street, and they're walking in, and they're going to, if you expect them to look at your menu and understand what glutathione is, BPC-157, uh, NAD, um, any of that is, and how that might impact them or whether that might be good for them, um, that's a problem because we're lay people. The folks like me who go into these centers, the only reason why I know what that stuff is is what I've been doing for 35 years. So I'm not typical, a typical buyer, but the buyers that go into the juice bar model, uh, they're not sufficiently educated. They don't have any clinical education and they don't have the ability to discern their current state of health or white, what might help it or hurt it. You know, to most people, low energy means I need a B B12 shot. You know, Sam Tejada talks about this a lot, and I think he's dead on. Most people just oversimplify. Here's my problem. I got low energy. I need this one solution um, that I read about or that I heard about or that my buddy told me about. That's a bad model because, in fact, you, you guys know as clinicians, there's all kinds of reasons why people's energy might be low. And there's all kinds of things that might be helped, but you have to match, you have to bioindividuate the treatment. In other words, diagnose, prescribe, and treat, right? Diagnose, prescribe, treat, and keep clinical records that document that you did the right thing. Otherwise what? You're risking your license. You're risking your license. You won't be able to forever just stand behind well, the patient uh, signed, an, signed an informed consent, picked the bag and sat down and got it, and there was no 
infiltration issue. We didn't have any problems in placing the line and, and the client didn't complain of anything. Uh, but the moment that you have uh, a, a patient that has an anaphylactic reaction or a reaction to the preservatives and some of the substances that you're using, the moment that you have to 911 one of your, your clients, and it does happen from time to time, is the day that you really wake up and you start asking the questions, what should I have done differently? How should I have uh, dealt with that patient? And do I have sufficient policies, procedures, clinical protocols? A lot of people will just follow a standing orders regimen, which is, in, in most cases, when they show them to us, they're really overbroad. They are not bioindividuated at all. And the patients that come in and do something that that is um, proposed to be kind of a mini clinical, it's self-directed, meaning somebody goes online or they fill out a paper. It's, they're never asked about anything. There was never really any meaningful interaction with the patient. So that model, the juice bar model, is inherently problematic, especially for licensed professionals that are involved in the business model, whether you're an RN or a nurse practitioner or a PA, uh, those are those are big issues for you because you worked hard to get your license. You don't want to lose it. So a lot of people, business people in particular, they go, oh my gosh, you know, I dehydration. I don't need a license to own one of those things. That's correct. But everybody that touches a patient or interacts with a patient does have a license. So you can't rely on the integrity or the awareness or the experience of a non-clinician who owns an IV hydration and expect that your license is, is protected and your ability to keep doing what you're doing is, um, is safe. You shouldn't do that. Um, it's your ass, right? So you need to know, you know, what are the policies and procedures? Do they, do they look, you should take a look at them. Don't just work for one and hope that, you know, they'll work out just fine. Uh, because ultimately, the um, existence of policies and procedures and clinical effect, efficacy and, and documented medical necessity, those issues, the existence of them or the non-existence of them at some point become your problem as a licensed person. They're not going to be a problem of the IV hydration center because it's not licensed. Now, yeah, it's true that centers could be shut down. They can get something called an ESO, an emergency suspension order from the attorney general's office. God forbid things like uh, what's happened in Texas where people um, have problems or Alabama, um, you know, all of a sudden that becomes the focus of the industry, at least in your location. Let's talk about how things go bad and how things go wrong. Because, you know, there's a, there's a machine, there are forces, if you will, behind every business. And the, the, the machine behind healthcare is legislation. And the way that works is you have legislators that um, got elected and they want to stay elected. That's their calling. That's what they want to do. And the overreaching job is to protect the public. So when anything in their jurisdiction goes wrong, they immediately say, aha, uh -huh, I can make a law. I can write a bill, take it up to Tallahassee, get it passed. I'll be the bill sponsor, and that will earn my right to get into office or stay in office. That's the way that works. And, of course, in Tallahassee, all of the regulatory bodies are there to do primarily what? Protect the public. Well, they don't get funded, and they don't get to exist, and they don't get to grow if they're not actively protecting the public. So now you have legislators and regulators who have the job to protect the public and they're looking for bad things. They're going to hear about it. Somebody's going to call them uh, or perspective, a perspective, a former employer is going to call them, excuse me, former employee is going to call them or a competitor that doesn't like what you're doing is going to call them and report you. And their job is to go find what's wrong and fix it for the public. So you understand that you're playing in that sandbox of, box of healthcare, which is inherently inclined towards public protection, and you want to make sure that you stay ahead of the curve. So even though the barriers to entry to the industry are low at the moment, 
They certainly won't stay that way. And we've and we're seeing signs and signals of that. Alabama, the Board of Medicine, Board of Medical Examiners, they're all over this issue. Meaning they're aware of IV hydration. They have concerns. They want to regulate it. South Carolina doesn't like it. Uh, Texas, you know, there was the story of the anesthesiologist not long ago who died from taking home a Myers cocktail and self-administering it. And so that's going to get uh, all kinds of regulatory attention in that state too, despite the fact that in that particular Texas case, it's the result of a crazy person that injected um, anesthetic into the IV into the uh, IV bag. But still, you have a regulatory body in Texas, and you have legislators whose job it is to protect the public, and they know they get to get in business and stay in business as a legislator or a regulatory body by actively protecting the public. So they're gonna dig into this. And we know, for example, in Europe, serious restrictions exist for IV hydration, the involvement of the medical director, who can own, what kind of policies and procedures they have to have. So we know that phase two is the regulatory, the, regula the regulation that really begins to expand. So right now, yes, it's flourishing. And so we're kind of in a, a kind of a gleeful period where people are really happy to get in the industry and meet patient demands for hydration, immune boosting, um, you know, anti-inflammatory uh, uh, impact. This is all great. But the way, the proper way to look at a quiet period like we're in, meaning a regulatory quiet period where there isn't a whole lot of encroachment, there's only one rational response, which is Self-regulate, self-regulate. If you don't define quality in a very meticulous and detailed way, it's going to define. It's going to be defined at you. It's not going to be defined for you. And who's representing the IV hydration industry in Tallahassee? No one. No one. So what happens is when laws start to get crafted and discussed. If, you're, if you don't have a seat at the table, your perspective isn't reflected in what the regulators think is a really good idea. So what's gonna happen is uh, regulation is coming, we know that. And I'll take you through some of these slides, I'm not just gonna talk without them, but I'll take you through some of these slides and I'll give you some examples of regulatory activity that's brewing and that it, we're being warned about, meaning the state and federal authorities are talking about their concerns. They're talking about their concerns. And there's two ways to respond to that. One is they're the enemy, and the other is they're your partner. The most productive thing you can do with respect to the Board of Medicine, the Board of Nursing, um, some of the federal regulators, uh, FDA, state, Board of Pharmacy, um, and any of the state or federal regulators is to understand what's important to them and give it to them. They're your partners, whether you like it or not. You don't get to stay in the IV hydration business if the Board of Pharmacy isn't happy, if the, Fed, if the Food and Drug Administration isn't happy with what you're doing, if the Board of Medicine, if the Board of Nursing, if these regulatory governmental agencies, which by the way have identified and began talking about the IV hydration industry, if you don't know what they want, you're not listening to what they want, and you're not giving them what they want, then your ability to stay in business is on a very shaky foundation. Like all business, but especially healthcare business, getting into business isn't hard. Staying in business is hard. That's where the work is going to be done. So again, begin to define quality. That means clinical protocols, policies, procedures. That means the, the, the usual pathway that you were used to following in an institutional environment of diagnose, prescribe, treat, document, that pattern, make sure it's really woven well into the industry, into your business. Whether you're working there or you own it, you can't afford to be on a bus that's going somewhere you don't want to go. And if the IV hydration place that you're working with or for 
isn't incorporating diagnosis, prescription, treatment, documented medical necessity, and records retention, those kinds of things, that's a shaky platform to be connected to. Let me take you through some of these slides and add a little flavor for some of them. And I, like I said, I don't want to go through each of these slides because you'll, you'll have them. Um, so the, 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 the silent partners, I, I mentioned them, your professional licensing boards, the FDA, the Federal Trade Commission, believe it or not, which generally adver uh, regulates advertising and promises that are made about healthcare items or services. They're up in arms about it. They're, they have an eye focused on this industry. In fact, they're actively enforcing in Florida now. I know that because we protect people when they, when they have that. Um, so, you know, the two mucks. You know what? There's a story about these two mucks just to kind of drive the point home. And the, the young monk is complaining, whining, you know, he's talking about stepping on rocks and how they hurt his feet. And, you know, he's just going on and on. And the old monk, because he's an older monk, just patient, patiently listens. No problem. Young monk gets done and the old monk then says, well, you can wrap the entire world in burlap. Or you can wrap your feet in burlap. That's really what the point I'm trying to drive home to you. Right now, there is no better time than pre-regulation to self-regulate. No better time. Diagnose, prescribe, treat, to the extent that you can incorporate any bio-individuality, you know, please do that. What, by whatever means is available, um, you're going to want to make sure that whatever you give a client is directly related to the client's needs and medical state. There are certain things that you guys have that are that will help, and there are certain things that you have that won't help and might even hurt somebody if they're not accurately and adequately connected to the patient's current health status. Check this out. This is the October 25, 2021 FDA memo. So what do they talk about? They're talking about uh, compound settings other than pharmacies. And we know, for example, 503A and 503B pharmacies, compound pharmacies, is where you're getting your supplies. Has anybody ever considered their liability for the supplies that they receive? Have you ever looked at an agreement that you might have, or are you just buying them? What if there's a bad batch and your patients are impacted? Do you have an agreement with the compound pharmacy that, in fact, you will be indemnified for those things? Do you have anything like that at all that allocates liability and risk for the product to the provider of that product? You should. Here's some specific cases. The Florida Department of Health, back in 2013, there was a voluntary recall of sterile use products. In 2016, there were a bunch of fungal infections linked to oncology medical practice. In July of 2020, um, it was a case, the Geyer Institute of Molecular Medicine, um, and the practice not only offered PRP, IV vitamin therapy, HRT, and lab testing, but um, advertised it in such a way that it really got the attention of the authorities. This is a claims issue, this, meaning if you make a lot of promises about what you're doing and you do that in your website and you do that in your materials, you have to be incredibly mindful of the fact that all of the promises that you're making, all the claims that you're making are come and get me. They're, they're invitations to regulatory authority, authorities. And there are so many other ways to communicate that something might be helpful or is reportedly helpful and linking people to clinical studies and more uh, scientific um, um, uh, data that and, and you can connect it on your website. You don't have to say, if you take this, then you're going to get that outcome. Because the more that you make those kinds of claims and promises, the more you get in trouble with um, regulatory bodies, federal and state. In February 21, the FDA action, this is, this is a, a, a person 50 years old. She got an, uh, 
she got a Myers cocktail and she ended up having multi organ failure. And there were a number of people out of that uh, that were connected to that batch from the pharmacy that got it. And they, they found out all kinds of problems um, associated with the, with the lab that, that provided it, excuse me, the pharmacy that provided it, and also the clinic. Uh, you know, all kinds of cleanliness issues. You don't have to become a compound pharmacy to, um, to be in the IV hydration business. But if you're going to reconstitute or you're going to compound, you're going to need to know about 503A and 503B, and you're going to need to know about 795 and 797, which are all the regs that pertain to compound pharmacies um, and, you know, for sterile products and non-sterile products. You're going to need to know those because if you have a laminar hood, in your space because you are doing some compounding or you are doing some um, reconstituting, okay, that's fine. Make sure you know those regs or you have a consultant in your pocket that knows them uh, inside and out because, by the way, they change all the time. Those of you who have an eye on this space will notice that 797 and 5 um, are proposed for some big changes this year, right? The FTC case, this is a big case against Charles Mock, he infused vitamins, high dose C, all kinds of stuff. But here's where he went wrong. Number one, he made all kinds of claims about what he was doing. And number two, he did certain really risk raising things in addition to speaking about claims. What did he do? Well, he used the C word, COVID. Like it or not, you start making claims about how something can help COVID, um, you're immediately front and center in terms of regulatory attention. Don't do it. He also did something that is really uncommon for this business space, which is he sought reimbursement from insurers for what he's doing, which is really unusual. And the moment that you decide, hey, you know what? We have uh, a great patient flow right now in the cash only space, but I bet we get more if we seek reimbursement for what we're doing. When you seek reimbursement, you put your head right into the jaws of the lion. The insurance companies are, they have a massive infrastructure to claw back money that they think there was no justification for, even when they don't think that there's any basis for doing it. In other words, that whole infrastructure to kick your tires. And then if they find anything that's not quite right, because maybe you didn't realize that the same clinical um, carefulness of a hospital is really required in your business, meaning diagnosis, prescription, treatment, record retention, documented medical necessity, um, privacy, um, compliance, all of those things that apply to any healthcare institution uh, you should assume apply to you. Um, you know, there's a little bit of a uh, schizophrenia at the regulatory level when you're dealing with IVs done in a physician office. You can read some of this, but the bottom line is the regula regulatory bodies have typically been hands off on what goes on in a physician's office. They don't like to go in and mess up uh, what physicians and physician practices are doing. They don't like to go in and inspect when there's a bunch of patients there. They don't, they like to have kind of a hands-off position. And even though the regulations on reconstituting, for example, in a physician's office are gray as hell, even though they're super gray, the regulatory bodies have traditionally been very deferential about how physician offices are dealing with those regs and how responsive they might be. But again, we're in a place right now where the regulations have not caught up to the pace of the, uh, of the industry growth. But we know they will. We know that the Board of Medicine, the Board of Pharmacy, Board of Nursing, the Federal Trade Commission, the Federal Food and Drug Administration, all of those bodies will begin talking about and uh, considering proposals to ensure public safety. And some of those things, you know, they're going on in, in, in many states. You know that. If you're in New York, you know that. If you're in California, Alabama, South Carolina, Texas, we deal with these issues all over the country. 
And it's a, it's really remarkable how much traction and attention this industry is getting at all of those regulatory levels. Not so much in the physician office yet, but there is talk about, do we need board of, board of pharmacy in particular? Does the board of pharmacy need to send more investigators into physician offices? It's happening a little, but largely in response to some pretty outlandish things where people are making promises that IV hydration can cure this and cure that and cure that. That's a sure way to make sure that you get a lot of people with uh, three-letter agencies knocking at your door and wanting to look through everything. We talked about the silent partners. We've talked a little bit about the fact that there's a lack of uh, regulatory uh, encroachment here, and there's also a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, clarity. But, you know, which leads me to, the, you know, another funny story about the guys and the bear. There are uh, two guys walking through the woods, and they both have backpacks on, and they're just walking through the woods. And all of a sudden, a big, big bear rears up and scares the bejesus out of both of them. So the one guy drops to his knee, takes off his backpack, starts rumbling through. And the other guy who's frozen and can't really do anything other than stand there says to him, what are you doing? And the guy who's bent down rumbling through his backpack says, I'm trying to find my tennis shoes. And the guy standing up says, well, you can't outrun that bear. And the guy in his backpack says, I don't have to outrun the bear. I have to outrun you. That's what time it is. If you get prepared now and you treat the industry as though it is regulated and you get to define what quality means and what kinds of things need to be in place and how you can do better to guard against the public health concerns that your silent partners have, meaning the regulatory bodies, you're going to be good. You're going to be substantial. So to cut to the chase, who will the winner, winners be? They're going to discover and accept what the regulators want. Look and look at some of the resources that I provided. Do your own research. What has the Federal Trade Commission said about it? What has the Food and Drug Administration said about it? What are boards of pharmacies and medical boards and boards of nursing saying about this industry? They're very articulate about what their concerns are, what they wish you had. Second thing, give it to them. Put your own policies and procedures together that really capture those concerns and stop skirting the issue of whether IV services are actually medical services. A lot of people, even clinicians, will say, well, you know, it's no big deal, which starts sounding like the hormone replacement therapy business that gets driven by patients who think that testosterone or triblend creams are like M&Ms, can't hurt. A little can't hurt, a lot can't hurt. I guess I'll just go get more. If things in healthcare that are entirely patient-driven and they drive you out of your protocol that's attached to your license are inherently dangerous, not just to you, but to your business. That's why we always say define quality or it's going to get defined at you. You don't have a seat at the table yet. There isn't really industry presence at the regulatory decision-making um, um, tables yet. And that means that lots of well-meaning people will come up with things that don't make any clinical sense to you. So define those things for yourselves now and be prepared for the second wave, which is the regulatory shakeout. That's all my contact information. You've got my, uh, you've got the, the uh, slides, it, but, uh, really start to dig in a little bit and prepare for the second wave, the regulatory uh, wave, and get prepared now and make sure that your clinical leaders are really taking the need for regulation, self-regulation seriously. And if they're not, consider where you belong, because the last man standing is going to be the ones that move from the juice park. Uh, type business model into a real clinical facility healthcare based model. Those are the ones that will win. I really appreciate you all taking the time this morning, this is it morning, afternoon, <laughs> out of your lunch hour. I had fun.
happy to talk with you anytime if you have any questions. Thank you all. Thank you.